Hi, everybody. Um, so um, my name is Andreas Olofsson, and I am the founder of a company that does parallel processing, and I'm also the founder of a project called Parallela. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about a, a couple of different things. First, I want to do an introduction to hardware, because uh, you know this is a software conference, so I figure I'll, I'll get myself in trouble. And, uh, and then I'm going to introduce the Parallela and why we made it and then talk a little bit about parallel programming. So uh, I tried to teach my 12-year-old daughter about hardware. And transistors, they just you know, don't speak to her. So, um, but you know, I, you know, I tried to teach the most fundamental things about hardware and what matters. Um, and so today, you know, most digital computers are based on CMOS. And um, so if you look at the you know, major concepts, and even though this is really, really basic stuff, um, I think it's important to remember that everything we run our software on is physical, and everything we do means something. It's, you know, Moore's Law has made transistors cheaper, but they are never free. So, um, so in terms of digital hardware, I mean, what's the transistor, right? You can, best, thing, best way of thinking about it, I think, is like a, a switch. Uh, and uh, a switch that, you know, like you have in your house that, you know, lets water flow through. And, uh, um, you know, when the switch is closed, no water flows through. Uh, so no, no water flows from the source to the sink. Um, and when it's open, water flows through easily. And, uh, and the sink, you know, if you draw the analogy, that would be the capacitor, right? So you build up water just like you build up charge on a, on a, on a, on a capacitor. And then when you reach a certain level, that can be used to trigger another circuitry. For example, if you had a little hole in the bucket that would lead out water, that would go to another switch. Uh, and you can actually make all kinds of you know, logic with, with just water. Uh, but obviously, this, the transistors are much, much uh, more efficient. So, um, so once you have a switch, a transistor, you use those transistors to build up gates, logic gates, that work on Boolean algebra, ones and zeros. Um, and so we have a NAND gate on the right-hand side. And so the battery can be considered the source um, that leaves, lets the water go through to the bucket. Um, and the, the, the ones on the bottom there, the, the NMOS transistors, will let the uh, water flow from the bucket down to the ground. Um, and so, but what we have there is, you know, there's a NAND gate, right? What do you do with NAND gate? Well, you can use NAND gates to build up pretty much anything. You can build up um, arithmetic units, adders, multipliers. You can build up control circuitly, things like if-else statements. Um, and, uh, but it doesn't have any storage, right? So that's where you have that circuit there, SRAM cell or a flip-flop or something like that, or a DRAM cell, which basically just stores charge on a capacitor. And you need to retain that charge for a long time, so you need to have some kind of retention, retention circuit or refresh circuit to, uh, to keep that in. But if you look at all modern CPUs, GPUs, uh, you, know, you name it, they're more or less made up of those two elements. Uh, and it does have an impact on energy, on cost, uh, and on performance. So um, that's, you know, that's modern CMOS hardware in, in, uh, in one slide. I mean, the, the really, really basics. Um, so, so I've been doing chip design for about 15 years. And I started designing, you know, kind of process stuff and uh, transistor level stuff, libraries for other guys doing chip design. And then I started doing logic. Then I did um, architecture. And um, so, so these are some of the things that I've kind of learned over the years and I think are pretty obvious today as we go forward. Uh, you know, what are going to be the limiting factors for all of computing going forward? So the first one being we're not going to scale frequency anymore. You know, that's done. We're at, you know, two, three gigahertz. It's never going to reach, you know, one terahertz. Um, obviously, people are always going to try but it's not going to be um, practical from a cost standpoint. So let's assume that we're done with the glory days of frequency getting faster, uh, better every year. Um, and so then what's the, you know, where are we going to get the performance from? Where are we going to get the next million times more performance that we got in the last few decades? You know, where is a million X going to come from? Well, the only way it can come from is parallelism, right? So from, from basically from 2004 forward, all the, um, performance gains have come from parallelism. And uh, that's 10 years now. And it's kind of saturating, because we're still trying to shoehorn our old software into a parallel paradigm. So from 2014 to 
20 whenever, or 3,000 whenever, it's all going to be by parallel computing. And that, that's pretty fundamental change. And the industry is pretty slow to, uh, to move over, uh, but it is going to happen. Uh, now, of course, when we go to parallel, uh, now you have to start thinking about um, you know, how much of my code is parallel, because we still code mostly in serial. We think in serial. We think of recipes. We still have things like this. You know, not every algorithm is uh, you know, parallel. So we have to fight Amdahl's law over, all the time. You know? So diminishing returns. So if we ever have a little serial piece in there, it's going to limit our performance gain. Um, now, of course, one of the things that Moore's law has done in physics is that things get smaller and smaller and smaller, right? And, uh, but we still want them to go fast. And so we burn more current and more energy per unit area than ever before. And the smaller you make something, the harder it is to get the heat out of it. And so you have a huge thermal issue. I mean, now you're getting down to physical limits. You know, how well can you get heat out of a, you know, a grain of sand? Um, so, so you're going to have to deal with that. So the, you know, one solution is let's not run as fast. If we, run, if we bring down the clock frequency, now it's not going to be as hot. Uh, or not, at least not as thermally dense. And, of course, that means you have to get the performance somewhere else. Right? Where, from where? We have maybe more parallel elements, so even more parallelism. Um, another thing is, as we scale down with Moore's Law, um, things were very robust. All we had in the system were ones and zeros. Well, as you get down to kind of quantum level, when you have, you know, 10 atoms between, um, between two nodes or between a you know, piece of glass, now you're getting down to quantum mechanical stuff. Um, and so you're going to have probability of failure that's going to be non-zero. And the more we push, the higher that probability of failure is going to be. So things will start failing. And if, for example, today, 99.9% .9 of all software written is um, completely sensitive to a single bit failure at the wrong time. And so, you know, what happens if we now have to rewrite all our software for assuming that the hardware will fail? Because it's going to be so costly to keep designing hardware that's going to be perfect. Unless, of course, we just want to stop. You know, no more CMOS scaling, uh, no more performance. But uh, if we want high performance and keep scaling CMOS, then things will start failing. Of course, if we look beyond CMOS, now we look at a new technology. Let's say, you know, um, carbon nanotubes or some kind of other technology. That's going to be a, a, a new manufacturing shift. And when you have new manufacturing, things are going to fail. So the idea of having you know, kind of robust software that can fix itself is a big thing. Um, bandwidth, uh, of course, as we make things smaller and smaller and smaller, we get a mismatch between our physical world and the actual chip. And uh, it gets very hard to get data into that little microscopic, you know, infinitesimally large device at a high rate. So we're always going to struggle with bandwidth, the smaller we make them. Um, now, the good news is that for the last n years, we really have never done extensive 3D integration. All our chips are planar. So you know, we, run, uh, we make the chips as large as we possibly can, and we cram as, in, as many transistors as we can. And, uh, and that's, how we, that's how Moore's Law works. Um, and, but we've never really explored the 3D, you know, the third dimension. Now, if we can stack chips, we can make the distances between devices much, much smaller. Um, and so 3D chip stacking is coming. Now that the low-hanging fruit of Moore's Law scaling is, is over, now we can start 3D integration, um, which is pretty cool. Um, energy efficiency. So an, another th you know, effect of Moore's Law, right? So Moore's Law uh, with scaling was that you used to be able to reduce the voltage every year. Uh, and at the same time, of course, you made the devices smaller, so they burn less power. And then all of a sudden, the voltage of the device stops scaling down. Uh, and now you're just basically cramming more devices in there. And they're slightly smaller, but you're cramming more of them in there. So today, energy efficiency is everything. And that's going to drive hardware. Uh, of course, to achieve that goal, hardware will have to be heterogeneous. Um, you could potentially make a very efficient fixed function device today. It would be incredible, but it wouldn't be programmable. So the idea is to kind of trade off hardware and software. And that's going to have a profound impact on software because you're going to have multiple architectures to program. It's not the kind of x86 rules them all or ARM rules them all. You're going to, uh, you know, many programs are going to have to deal with multiple architectures at the same time. Um, of course, 
we don't want to move backwards to the, the days when we used to uh, you know, do um, punch cards and uh, assembly programming. We want to stay at a high level of productivity. Uh, and so in order to do that and yet achieve the energy efficiency at the same time, we're going to have to do multiple languages. Um, and uh, that way, you know, kind of keep, keep the best, best of both worlds. Um, and then, you know, finally, as we do these massively complex uh, projects, um, development costs are going to be a big thing. And the same thing, you know, so open collaboration. Uh, and finally, the latency part. Another physical constraint. Most, many of these things are physical constraints. Failure rate, quantum mechanics. Uh, thermal density, you know, thermal law. Um, uh, frequency, physics, uh, latency, speed of light. So we're obviously not going to change the speed of light, so how do we deal with that? Well, we make things smaller, um, and we make things more dense. Um, so those are kind of the things that are going to come out, are starting to come out today, but are definitely going to come out in the next 10 years. So, um, so, but the clear thing is we're going to have CPUs in the future. There's no doubt about that. Uh, there is an enormous amount of code today that runs good enough today. And so they will probably run good enough tomorrow. And there will be new applications so that all they need is a couple of gigaflops or you know, one processor running at one gigahertz. You get, uh, if you get a throughput of uh, you know, 10 millisecond and that's meant to interact with the human, clearly fast enough. Um, and so you know, what, and what is a CPU? You have some memory, you have a, C, a scheduler, you have maybe a, a functional unit or a floating point unit that does the mathematical work. And that's, you know, that's your programming model. Um, very, very simple, absolutely the most productive platform we've seen, and it's done miracles for, for decades. Um, so that will be there forever. You know, it's kind of a funny thought, you know, that you could imagine having a, an x86 CPU running C code 200 years from now. Um, it would be bizarre, but it's probably going to happen. Um, now, after we've explored you know, all the performance of, of a CPU, and we can't go any faster. We're stuck at two gigahertz. If we need a boost from there, uh, an easy one is SIMD programming, so vectorized programming. This would be like a, kind of that picture that, you know, you have a, a military, right? A, you know, um, a, a commander would say, you know, step right, and the whole line would step right in lockstep at one time. Not, you know, it, they all have to do everything at the same time, so one command at a time. And uh, although you could potentially make a ridiculously large vector, you know, to infinity, uh, practically it wouldn't work. Just like, you know, you can't practically make a, um, uh, an infinitely fast processor. Um, you get all kinds of uh, effects like um, delays of those commands, right? So just like, in a, you know, if you make this row, uh, this row of soldiers here infinitely long, eventually the, the commander, you know, the guy at the end wouldn't be able to hear the command being said. But up to, let's say, a four-way works very well. Uh, there are things like SSE, Altivec, uh, Neon um, extensions, uh, the GPUs use CMD. So clearly, this is a well-known programming method and way of thinking. And a lot of the stuff we do in math is vectorized. It's, it's very parallel. Um, you're, you're, running, um, um, you're running the same operation on every pixel and image. So there you go. Very easy to conceptualize this kind of parallelism. So SIMD, pro, you know, SIMD hardware is going to be there because it's very effective for a certain class of problems. Um, but then there is this uh, new way, you know, a kind of new, new style of architecture that's coming out. And the idea is that the first two really don't scale. They have, um, uh, they don't, uh, they aren't distributed. Um, the and so. After you've finished all the tricks of SIMD and you know, the CPU improvements, how are you going to scale to infinity you know, without limitation? And the only really way to do that is to have a distributed type architecture. And so um, a lot of companies now are working on many core architectures where you integrate the networking and the memory and the computational in one tile. And then you only have nearest neighbor communication. And so by cutting no global interconnect, no global variables, variables you only have point-to-point -point communication. Now you could theoretically actually scale to infinity or whenever you run out of devices in the world. Um, and um, um, it's, um, so I think of that like, you know, like a, it's kind of like a soccer team with, uh, you know, 
a million players and a million games going on at the same time. Uh, it's complete chaos, but you can manage it. So that's you know that's what that's what I started six years ago. Um, that was uh, that was kind of what I started a company around. And so I, I built this processor that had uh, a, a sea of processors connected with a network. Um, and uh, but it, you know so it was it was a it was kind of a sea of C programmable processors. So RISC, right? I mean a reduced instruction set. Uh, nothing revolutionary there, except it was very, very tiny. It was a tiny instruction set. Um, we had memory, but no caches. So no hardware caching. So you had, somebody had to take care of bringing in the data and instruction um, by himself, uh, whether that's a compiler or, or a scheduler or a, a manual programmer. Uh, there's a router there that passes data around between the processors. Um, uh, and even like an automatic data movement engine. So the idea here was that um, the design philosophy was in the old processors, you know, the x86 and others, the amount of energy that goes to useful work is on the order of 1% to 3%. Everything else is there for the benefit of the programmer or for the, well, yeah, actually, mostly for the benefit of the programmer. <laughs> and so... Um, so, you know, can we do something to reduce that, you know, 99 to 97% waste that we have to 10%, let's say, or 20%? Um, and um, and that's, that's what we did. So, uh, so we cut away all the legacy, and it was, I mean, it was truly remarkable how much we can cut away. Um, so to the point where we can actually put 4,000 CPUs on a single chip. Of course, we're not the first people to ever talk about parallel computing. Even today, it's, it's absolutely an uphill battle every single place I go to. And uh, um, before us, there were tens of companies that all tried. Not a single one of them ever managed to get general purpose traction. Some of the companies managed to do a solution, and maybe they became their own customer or their own programmer. So they said, you know, wireless base stations, they need really high performance computing. So, um, so the only way to achieve that and make a program was by parallel. So companies would make a base station chip. Of course, nobody wanted to program the thing, so they decided, well, then we'll program it. So they would sell basically a programmable base station solution that only they could program. Um, and there were some companies that were modestly successful like that. But if we're talking about the future of computing being in parallel, then there needs to be a truly parallel computing device. Now, it could be said that maybe GPUs have reached that status, because there's certainly thousands of programmers writing OpenCL code or CUDA code. Um, but that's for a very, very specific application domain. And, you know, just like in, in the serial threaded programming world, there's tons of choices um, and dizzying sometimes. And you get these communities grow up that, you know, center around a certain domain and a certain programming style. Um, and a lot of them are, I would say, very, very fringe. Uh, but there's a few that stand out that seem to have built, you know, pretty solid communities. Um, Erlang certainly uh, was created by Ericsson in the 1990s, has been a very good, scalable, um, robust um, environment. Um, and so a few programmers who are very skilled have been very successful applying that. Um, you know, guys like uh, WhatsApp, for example, right, used Erlang for me message passing. Um, Another one, uh, OpenCL, we talked about, you know, the graphics programming uh, or image processing um, has been very su successful. Um, guys like Adobe have talked about using that publicly. Uh, OpenMP has been rather extensively used in financial, in high-performance computing, because it gives a very nice boost on multi-core platforms. So you, if you have a multi-core Intel CPU, like a Xeon, you write some pragmas in OpenMP, and there you go, 4 to 8x improvement fairly easily. Um, and the same one, MPI, uh, down in the bottom, um, the guys who really want to scale their computers, and, you know, the kind of top 500 supercomputers, well, the only way to scale at the kind of hyperscale that they're talking about is to have um, zero bottlenecks in the system. And right now, the only types of programming models that really support um, massive scale like that, that are message passing programming models. And, and the famous one from supercomputing is MPI. So, uh, and I would say the things that aren't in the blue here are maybe very interesting programming languages, 
but they don't have a big following or community, so there's always the danger that the programming language just dies out. So, um, we started this project, Parallela, in 2012. Uh, we launched it on Kickstarter, and uh, one of the key goals for the project was to become a platform for exploring parallel computing. And uh, in the US alone, hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested in trying to make parallel programming easier, funded by NSF, by DARPA, and clearly nobody solved the problem yet. And so uh, we said, well, we're going to do a grassroots movement. We're going to launch this platform, make it very, very cheap, make it completely open source, and uh, spread it around the world. You know, so instead of a, a couple of big universities getting big checks of $100 million, now every single university who wants access can actually start their own parallel computing research program, um, and they will not be tied into one architecture. You know, one of the things that's kind of been pissing me off for a few years has been the attraction to proprietary platforms. Now, every platform is proprietary in some sense because you maybe have something there, something there that only exists from one company. For example, we have this chip epiphany. We're the only ones who make that. But if you make that layer, that proprietary layer, as thin as possible, then most people should be able to get away with writing, um, thinking about a high level of abstraction that can move across platforms. But, um, um, but so yeah, so we wanted to make this as open as possible so that people don't get tied into to, uh, any one architecture. But so what is it? It's a single board computer, just like the Raspberry Pi that uh, uh, presenter filled up the room. So. Clearly, we're not as well known as the Raspberry Pi, but it's a credit card sized computer. Uh, I always walk around with mine in my shirt pocket, so it's this big. Um, and uh, it runs Linux, Ubuntu, has HDMI on it, USB, gigabit Ethernet, uh, one gigabyte of RAM. And, you know, today, I would say it's a, it's a pretty solid computer. Um, of course, if you're 1990 terms, it would be a supercomputer. Uh, but today, it's just a, it's a pretty solid computer board. Um, and it does, depending on if you have 16 or 64 CPU cores, it does between 25 and 100 gigaflops, which is, which is quite good, uh, especially the 100 gigaflops. And to do 100 gigaflops at less than 5 watts is, is interesting. Um, if you think about the devices today that can do 100 gigaflops and be programmable by user, you're talking maybe about an i7 from Intel, uh, the computer would probably run 100 watts full throttle, whereas this runs 5 watts full throttle. Um, the one thing that you always know about the, the biggest supercomputers in the world or, um, or any machine is that if you're going to brute force it, if you're willing to throw any dollar amount on it or any you know, power or size on it, you can pretty much scale to any size. And what, is, what does constrain the system at the end of the day is size, weight, and power. Those are you know, fundamental physical things. Um, so just uh, showing the board again, um, it has this device called Zinc, which is a hybrid um, dual-core ARM slash FPGA. So the dual-core ARM runs the operating system, you know, you, you load uh, U-boot, Ubuntu, um, and, and then you just at home. You can SSH into it, you can log, you know, use a USB keyboard, a screen, use it as a computer. Um, and then next to that, it has this uh, field programmable gateway logic. And uh, which is kind of cool because it allows you to design your own hardware. Anybody basically with a software tool can design their own hardware. And so you can give this thing flavor. So instead of having a hard-coded board that can only do, um, be configured in one way, um, here you can make it do all kinds of weird things. For example, uh, the pins going out of that uh, hardware can go to the I.O. and now you can basically interface to any device as long as you have enough pins and run at the right speed. Uh, things like cameras, um, things like displays, motors, um, uh, radios, antennas, you go, you know, going down the line. Some very, very interesting things can be done with this. But of course, the key component that we, we brought here, and, and, and the second reason why we did this, we wanted a, a product around our chip. And since we hadn't convinced anybody else to design a product around chip, we designed our own product around our chip. And so there's this coprocessor. So the way the system would work is that you would boot in to, to Zinc, now you're inside the Zinc, uh, sorry, you boot into ARM, running a, a Linux, um, and uh, we configured this FPGA logic to hook up the ARM directly inside the memory map of the ARM 
to our coprocessor device that sits next to it. So it's not, you know, our device doesn't run Linux, the 16 core, but uh, it does have 16 CPUs. It just runs stuff, math, hard, you know, high, high end stuff. Um, uh, but so, yeah, so now we're sitting in, in Ubuntu and we have access to gigabyte of RAM um, and we start sending tasks out. So you can think of the, um, think of a model like uh, um, where you have a client, a laptop, and you have a server farm somewhere. The E16, there's kind of the server farm for the client. Um, now, on the back of the card, we have these connectors. So, uh, um, just like uh, you know, some other boards, if you know the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi or the BeagleBone, they have usually 0.1 inch connectors, so pretty large pins. Um, in this case, because we had it, this is just a, a, a beast in terms of performance, we also need you know a lot of bandwidth to get into this thing. Otherwise, it's uh, you're going to be like drinking the ocean out of a straw. And so we put high end connectors so that we can basically get 50 gigabits per second of I.O. into the card. Now, I mean, think about that, right? So we have a one gigabit Ethernet connection, which is still today pretty good. But having 50 gigabits of, per second on a $100 card um, in a credit card size form factor is, is, is truly, uh, truly ridiculous. So uh, again, going back to you know why we made this board and this product, uh, and we worked very hard on it for about two years. Uh, we uh, we struggled a little bit of production, but uh, this year we've shipped 10,000 of these boards to uh, over 200 universities um, and a lot of enthusiasts, um, you know, hackers, geeks, consumers, companies, researchers, military organizations. Um, so, um, um, but. Um, so what you know? So what's the reason here, right? So one is research, uh, exploring things like new parallel programming languages, um, new parallel algorithms, because again we have to rip up all our old algorithms if they don't scale. So that's been a, a very very rewarding uh, collaboration that we've done. Uh, second one is teaching. Now this has been kind of tough, um, and uh, you know we're hopeful that uh, some of those university partners are going to come back and actually start teaching with this platform. We do have a couple of universities that are now teaching system courses and parallel programming courses inside the universities. Now, it's going to be great when maybe those courses come out and then they can teach the whole world. Uh, in the meantime, I owe all the Kickstarter backers a book on parallel programming, but, uh, but since I'm not a, parallel pro I'm not a software developer, um, it's, it's been kind of, kind of tough going. Um, so, uh, third one which has, was not really a goal when we started the project, but has become a huge uh, success, has been an embedded. So because this thing has an ARM, FPGA, and a DSP core processor, um, it's kind of the perfect platform for doing a lot of stuff in robotics, in drones. And of course, because of the density, this is really the only platform that could do the job. So we have um, between five and 10 active projects just in drones. So the idea is that um, and most of these people are doing the same thing, right? You put a camera on the drone, um, which is now streaming images from the ground, and then you, you pipe that into the parallel board, and now you do something with it. For example, it could be object tracking. Uh, so you, you, know, you track in on some object in the image, and then you make the drone do something based on that. Um, that functionality doesn't exist today. Um, and you can imagine how many useful things that could do. Search and rescue. Um, Agriculture, right? Um, um, locating, locating areas of a huge farm or huge forest area where you have a problem, and discovering before it happens. Uh, reducing the amount of pesticide a farmer has to um, to uh, to put out on it, on his farm. Um, an enormous amount of of positive value. And where is this coming out from? From having more performance in a smaller area with less energy. Right? You're never going to fly a a cabinet size server configuration on a 100 gram drone because your payload needs to be 100 grams. So that, that, that's pretty cool. And that, that's been kind of showing the first kind of really uh, visible data points that show that the, the future is parallel because we chose a parallel architecture and this is the outcome of it, right? The, the, the five watt credit card size computer is the result of the technological direction we took. Um, 
Um, and, and then finally, uh, it's a fun toy, right? So we have a lot of people who've taken the toy, uh, done weird demos with it, um, just for fun. Of course, since this is kind of like a, a very, very high-end computer, you probably wouldn't do a cat feeder with this thing or uh, you know, a, a beer pourer, unless you want to pour your beer really, really fast. You, you know, this is, so the projects tend to be pretty complicated, and that's been one of our challenges, that because the projects are so, so complicated, you really need to spend probably a couple of months if you want to do something really sophisticated. And so that kind of bridges over to where not a lot of people are going to spend a couple of months on a hobby project. You want to do something in a, in a weekend, but there's so much here. Um, so, so yeah, so coming back to the principles, we wanted this to be much, much, much cheaper than $1,000. Um, $1,000 are very few people who can afford to pay, including universities. So we initially set the price at $99. Um, of course, the volume that we ship, 10,000 units, is not high volume. When you talk to the manufacturers in Taiwan and China or anywhere else, they go 10,000 units. I don't get up in the morning for less than a million units. And so uh, it's hard to reach consumer level pricing with not in consumer level shipments. So, um, but we, we chose $99 because that would enable anybody to get it. Just like Raspberry Pi picked 25 or $35 because that's gonna democratize access to cheap computing. Um, now, in terms of the approach to openness, um, we pretty much went all the way. So completely open documentation, zero binary blobs, so no proprietary drivers, um, only use open standards and open APIs, um, and all open source hardware. The only thing that we kept ourselves was the internal workings of our chip. Um, and, you know, we always think that maybe someday we'll open up that as well, but for now, because the only people who really could benefit from that uh, are our competitors, and they don't open source anything. It seems that it wasn't quite the quid pro quo we were looking for. Um, so, uh, and it's, you know, all the code, all the collaboration is up on either GitHub or our forums. So just, uh, just putting this in perspective for a second. Um, so the, the 64 core board that I, I was holding up uh, has about 100 gigaflops. Uh, and uh, in five watts. Now, if we go back, you know, 20 years, the strongest machine in the world, the CM5, uh, thinking machines up in, in Boston, um, had a thousand processors, it was about 100 gigaflops at 100 kilowatts and cost $30 million. So in 20 years, we've gone from something that filled up a, a nice size room and cost $30 million to something that every man could get. Now, the only thing I say, you know, could get here was we, our Kickstarter goal, when we ran the, the campaign, we set two goals. We said, if we, if we raise $900,000, we can produce a 16-core device. If we raise $3 million, we can produce a 64-core device. And the difference in cost there has to do with the process technology. And um, so to get the 64-core device, we had to use a 28-nanometer process. 28-nanometer process costs $3 million to do. It's just a fact. There's no way of getting around it because it's so complicated. And so even the design could have been put into any, any manufacturing process, um, you really couldn't do it in, um, in, in 65 nanometer and, and do 16 cores, uh, and 64 cores very practically. So we made 100 of them. They worked perfectly as a prototype, but we couldn't get into full, full volume manufacturing, which is very frustrating because now we have this uh, device that exists you know, as a publication, exists as a physical device, um, but it doesn't exist as a product. So we're still working on that. Um, so um, my, uh, my advice for anybody who, who thinks they're, you know, they have code or applications that, um, that are high performance would be that um, <coughs> you think of scale in terms of thousands of threads. So in the past, when Intel and others would just scale the frequency every year, you can kind of almost get away with having one code and just running it, right? You have binary compatibility. Every processor would just automatically give you a boost. Uh, to get that kind of frequency boost to happen automatically, uh, you're going to have to think about um, writing your code in such a way that you're impervious to uh, the number of cores in the system, right? So you can scale with it. Uh, so that would mean like writing the code that it, you know, it, it is, um, is dynamically scalable. 
and having a programming paradigm that is dynamically scalable. So you can basically you plug in your code right on a system with 16 cores. You know it's going to run on 16 cores potentially. Um, if you plug it into a system with you know a thousand cores, it can run on a thousand cores. And so the I mean, there's already things like this today, right? A lot of people are using Elastic Clouds, Amazon and others, where you go, right, I'm going to turn on my application for N cores. And so you built in that kind of dynamic scalability. Uh, now, at the chip level or inside a processor, we really never had that. But that needs to come. The second thing is, since we threw away the caches, uh, and this is still very, very controversial, 99% um, of the industry are saying, no, 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 you have to have caches, you have to have cache coherency. Um, we're saying, well, how does that scale to a thousand processors? Do, do caches scale to a thousand processors? Because we could build that today. Well, no, it doesn't. Nobody has solved that problem yet. And uh, we contend that it's not a solved problem. Um, and uh, so if you throw away the caches and the cache coherency, well, then something or someone needs to manage the memory. And uh, um, I, it, it cannot be the programmer. I mean, if every single programmer has to manage his own memory, his productivity is going to go way, way, way down. Uh, and so, I mean, you just see the, the difference in programming in C versus something like Java, where you, uh, you have to do your garbage, garbage collection manually. That's annoying and non-productive. Um, well, here, what if you had to manage data movement, moving your bits around, doing mem copy all over the place, basically, to specific locations, um, and managing your heap? Uh, with thousands of threads running, right? Um, that, that's, gonna, that's not going to work. So there needs to be a runtime. And that's where the parallel programming research comes in. What should that runtime look like? Um, so it's a very active area of research. Um, uh, another implication is the compute density and the compute efficiency, a lot of that has to do with moving bits around. Now, I don't know very many programmers who think about where their bits are stored on a board or in the system. It sits somewhere on a server, right? Server index N, maybe, right? Or server host name. Um, well, if you have two servers and you have some cables between them, if those cables are longer, you burn more energy. So uh, you kind of need a, a layout uh, or a map of your data center. Where in that data centers are your, um, are your bits stored? Now, of course, here also, really, uh, a tool or a schedule should take care of that. But something in the system needs to know where the compute is in relation to the bits being stored. Uh, and we found that, that the hard way in our architecture. Um, and it's extremely important. Now, the hard, because the hardware will fail, um, you know, software needs to be redundant. Uh, or the programming language or the scheduler needs to be such that it can handle it. And so when you start looking at parallel programming languages, you, you think, well, why was the parallel program, and you know, why was the language written, right? So you take something like C. C was written with a certain application in mind. It was extremely successful for that. It's a, about as close as you can get to assembly without writing an assembly. Uh, now, Erlang, for example, with, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, was written for uh, robustness in mind first. Um, and so because, you know, when, when switches and communication equipment fails, it's very, very expensive and very, very bad for, uh, for the company. So, uh, so there, robustness was a first-class citizen. In C, performance was a first-class citizen. Um, but if you write programs, um, then assume that they will fail, and they will f continue to fail and fail even more in the future. Um, and the only way to, lang to manage this and stay sane is to have more than one language. So if you want performance and scalability and robustness and all these things, you're going to have to use more than one language. And I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, you know, if you look at modern programmers, they might know anywhere from two to ten different languages and jump between them at ease. And, and finally, because of the speed and uncertainty of, of technology movement, I would never, ever become a slave to a proprietary platform. So stay open, stay unattached, and of course, you, know, you, you, know, you have to dig in and do something eventually with a proprietary piece of device, but um, don't get married to a proprietary API. 
And of course, um, never forget about Amdahl's law. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things that you know, I need to put up a note uh, on my wall, or most people should. You know, if you ever start thinking about getting a 100x speed up or even 10x, um, just go back and think, all right, well, did I take every single bottleneck out of the system? Did I take every piece of serial code out of the system? Because if you don't, you will never get more than 10x. It gets increasingly more difficult and increasingly more expensive in terms of a thought process and coding style to get the you know, 100x to 1,000x. I mean, they, the supercomputing guys have basically found that they, they need to have zero um, serial piece in their code. That's the only way to do it. Of course, even if you have zero um, serial code, you still have to move the data around. So you still have bottlenecks. So now you start thinking about distributed databases, distributed file systems, things like Hadoop. It's all about reducing the bottlenecks and decoupling everything. Um, and and you know once you do that, now you really have to think about it's all about locality and uh, and algorithms, right? You start looking at the algorithms. Say, do I have any interdependencies in, inter interdependencies in here? Um, maybe it's better to duplicate my data. So I broadcast my broadcast my data. So now I have you know, a complete database sitting on every single node. Um, and that's what I work with. So um, I'm just going to go through a, 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 a few different styles um, that can be, or techniques that can be used for, for parallel programming. Um, and I'm going to, you know, pick from those winning, winning languages, or winning communities that, that we've seen. Um, the first one being bash scheduling is absolutely my favorite. Um, I've used it for 20 years as, as a chip designer. It's easy. I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't even call it parallel programming, but it's, it's really effective at, at crunching through work. Um, second one, SIMD programming, has been a big thing for 20 years, uh, even more than that if you count this, the Cray supercomputers, uh, which used vectorized um, processors for, for pretty much from the beginning. Um, so, but the idea there is data parallelism. Uh, and then fork join, you know, where you have a piece of code and you get to a critical piece and then you go, all right, I have to speed this up. Uh, this kind of uh, pinpoint um, optimization. And then finally, message passing, which is a completely different way of thinking, uh, but, but the, the one that scales. So, so what's the idea behind a, a, a bash scheduler? Um, I mean, I'm sure every, everybody here has run bash scheduling in some way at some time. Uh, but, you know, you sit... You as a user or uh, you know, a set at a client, you say, all right, I have a job to run. In my case, it was uh, chip simulations. And uh, so I would have a model of the chip, and um, I would have a, a random generator, right? <coughs> a random program generator. And the program would test my chip. And so the only thing that, you know, so I would generate, have a seed, right? Uh, I would generate a seed, and the seed would be used as an input to uh, a program generator that would program, you know, generate an L file, basically. And uh, because that seed only ran once, uh, basically there's no coupling. So basically the input there is time of day, more or less. And then the output is test pass or test fail. So there's no data output. There's really no data input either. Um, and so you have, you know, if you draw a circle around the system, there's no flux in or flux out of the system. There's no bandwidth, uh, which is great. Of course, there is some temporary data. The model had to sit somewhere, uh, and that temporary test had to sit somewhere. But that is something that you can easily distribute over an, almost an infinite number of servers. Um, and so what we do, we use something called LSF. Today, you probably use Slurm or something else. Uh, you would uh, you'd have a job you want to do. You tell the Slurm, I want to run this job on N servers. Um, and uh, there might be multiple clients on there that want to talk to the Slurm dispatcher uh, and use the, the data center or the server farm. Um, and so they have to have uh, you know, resource sharing. Uh, but um, it's an incredibly effective way of programming. But the key here is how fast is your network? You know, how decoupled is your uh, database? Uh, or you, do, have you pushed all the data out there already? And so we had to do lots of tricks to make sure that we weren't flooding. Like, for example, we start off with a single file server. And then all these jobs to put the files from the file server. And then we found that, oh, that was running slow. And then we start pushing the data to each server. And then we found a, a huge speed up. Um, and um, so there are tr tricks like that. Of course, we always were buying faster switches, uh, faster uh, servers, and more servers uh, to scale out. 
but um, you know, not forgetting about this programming model because you know, it is very easy to use. It's low-hanging fruit. If you can formulate your problem so that you have complete decoupling of data, um, this is the one to choose. Now, compare that model, uh, you know, sitting on the beach kind of model, I would say this is sitting down in the dungeon, right? This is OpenCL. Um, so this is SIMD programming for GPUs. Um, or you can use them for our device or for hardware. I don't particularly like this model very much. Uh, it's very verbose. Uh, you have to do a lot of manual management. Now, you could say that this is the assembly version of parallel programming. So there's going to be layers above this that will make it much, much easier. But the key here is that you have to manage your own memory. That's the um, um, create buffers and, and free at the, at the end, or release. Uh, you have to create your own command queues. You have to create your own, uh, you have to launch your own program. Um, and uh, even to the point that, you know, initially it was all in, just in time compiling. So you actually put in your code snippet inside your, your code. Um, so to me, this is a huge step backwards. You know, if, if we're going to make, this is not making parallel programming easy. This is making parallel programming like the assembly program of the 1980s. So, uh, but it is very effective. And there are people who are very good at using this to make their GPUs and other devices run at almost full, um, uh, full capacity. So, but the idea here is, and, and this is just, uh, um, you know, the, the whole code here, right? We only have one thing in here, and that's the, uh, this uh, sum of products down here, right? That's the one line of code that does anything useful in this. So we talked about efficiency, just like in a CPU, you know, 99% of, uh, of, the, of the energy goes to doing things like caching, buses, I.O. Well, here, 99% of the code goes to doing other stuff that's not the one line of code that we want to focus on. Um, so, uh, so I'm not a big fan, but this is, a, you know, the good thing. Well, I would, should say something good about this program model. It's, it's, it's very flexible, and it scales very well. You know, you can run data level vector parallelism up to a thousand threads here. Uh, uh, and this is to be compared with the old style of Cindy programming, which was usually little pragmas in your C code or little libraries to use the SSE or the NEON instruction set, which usually doesn't scale more than four. Same thing compilers, auto vectorizing compilers. They're usually pretty good up to four. This one, because it's expressed by the programmer, you can scale out to a thousand or a million here. Um, but it is very tedious to program in OpenCL. Uh, then you have things like op OpenMP um, and Java and other things, um, where you have a fork join model, and uh, which is um, you know you have the the goods and bads of of of, of threads, right? Good thing about threads is there's a fair amount of people who know about them. The bad things is it doesn't scale very well beyond a fairly small number of threads. Let's call them eight threads or 16 threads. Uh, and you still have the questions about races and uh, um, weird things like that. So you have the, the, you know, all the problems of parallelism, but you don't have all the rewards of parallelism. So, um, but it is a very effective way of getting 10x. And so the idea is that you have a you put some pragmas in your code in OpenMP that describes the, the region that you want to parallelize, uh, and then you create the threads, and then you have a barrier that joins them together. Um, now, uh, in MPI, um, it's also quite verbose. Um, the, 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 the major thing here is the, the idea that you, you create a, a, a bunch of processes in your system. Um, and so, um, and usually you'd have uh, one process per server. So just like the Slurm model, the, the batch scheduling, you would have a, a client node that would launch the job and a ton of server nodes that would take care of, of the processing on a, on a per processor basis. And every process gets an ID. Uh, and then there's a fairly sophisticated uh, runtime scheduler that keeps track of all these IDs and where things are. Uh, and uh, the key here, I mean, the, the real key is that to, to do the, the inter-processor communication, the way you do that is you use these send and receive calls. 
And so basically communication between processes is explicit with a function call. And, um, and that's, that's okay. But the, the real the gain here is that you run the same program. You run a single program, multiple data thing. You run the same program on every core in your system. And then you have some code in the program that asks more or less, who am I? If I am core this, I do this. If I am core that, I do that. And usually do that means fetch this data instead of that data. So you get a little bit of dependence in your code, depends, depending on the ID that you have. Um, and then you need to, yeah, you have a little bit of control for there. But, but, it's, um, but, the, but the real trick here is thinking about uh, the single program multiple data. Um, with this kind of stuff, you kind of have to draw a picture. And because it is rather non-intuitive. Um, so, um, so why, you know, what, what's going to happen after this, right? So, um, so explain four different programming models, and, and you know how many cores there are in a system today. Um, you know how many vectors there are. Um, so this is what, what we're going to build if we live that long enough as a startup. But technically, this is absolutely mundane. There's nothing revolutionary here. And we already built the first generation, so everything else in, is an extrapolation based on building bigger chips, you know, chips allowed by current vanilla technologies, and scaling down, right? So we know that everybody, TSMC and all these big factories, uh, are working on scaling CMOS down to 14, and then 10, and then 7 nanometer. Um, I trust that Intel and others will make this happen. Um, and so you know you're going to get things are going to get smaller and denser uh, as we go along. Um, that's clear. Um, and we also know where we are today, right? So these are just extrapolation numbers. There's no, there's no hocus pocus here. Um, and so, but the conclusion is that there will be chips made in 2018, only four years from now, with 64,000 CPUs on a single chip. So, you know, anybody who's looking at fork join or OpenMP and they're getting 8x speed up, right? What are they going to do with the other, you know, 60... 3,992 cores. You know, that kind of parallelism is, um, is frightening. And uh, so um, that's, that's, what coming at, that's what's coming out. That's what's going to happen. So um, I, um, I always try to get people to realize that if this is going to happen, how do they, what do they have to do to prepare? Because uh, no, I don't think anybody's prepared today. Um, so... Um, yeah, so we've got a, a lot of things going on, a pretty active uh, community, ton of universities, uh, students, um, and um, a bunch of open source repositories. We are, but the one thing we're absolutely starving for are collaborators uh, and contributors. Um, we, uh, small team, work 24 hours a day, uh, uh, love the work we do, but um, it's a lot left to be done. So that's my, uh, that's my presentation. I love questions about anything. Yeah? Is there a showcase for uh, parallel projects? The board's been out for about six months now. Is there any way of seeing what's been achieved on it? Um, sure, yeah, yeah. So um, you mean like, um, what, like, like what have people done with it? Like uh, stories? Yeah, yeah, so we have, um, has to be organized a little bit better, but it's quite a bit. Basically right now it's just a, link, uh, a list of links. Uh, but we have, uh, we have publications, we have, um, um, we have a bunch of examples that people have contributed to the, uh, to the GitHub there, github.com parallela. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, start at the website, parallela.org. If it's not there today, it'll be there soon. <laughs> So, so, so we've run uh, Java 8 on this, right? So, I mean, since we have a general purpose ARM processor uh, running Ubuntu, installing Java is trivial, right? So we, we've installed it, uh, very, a lot of other people have installed it. Where we haven't quite uh, finished the work yet is in plugging in um, Java with our SDK. So, you know, the, the, the parallel part. And um, 
One of the things that was holding us back was we didn't have a driver for our device. So we had to run everything as root. And didn't, we didn't want to hack that. So right now we just released an SDK where we have a proper kernel driver um, in Linux. And, and now that we can do that, we should have a pretty good path. I, I really wanted to have to present something with Java today, but because the SDK was only released this week, I didn't have time to. But uh, yes, the plan is we're going to have you know, callable functions and executables from, um, from Java. I sorry, I missed that question. Could you speak up a little bit? No, you would need to do some kind of um, a native call-in. So, so you can you can use fork join right to to create Java threads. That's no problem. But inside each thread, you would need to do something that calls the epiphany. Right, because the you know we don't have a you know we're not in the same memory space, right? So we don't run Linux processes on our our on our um, on our device, the Epiphany coprocessor. So in order to use the coprocessor, it needs to be a shim, basically a, a light thread that runs on the ARM that you know talks to maybe one core on the Epiphany, and so so that you know so imagine that you have a, a Java fork join that inside there does. Uh, does a call to um, you know encrypt key, and the encrypt key inside there that calls the um, uh, the epiphany function or the epiphany tools, right? So um, that that's kind of the model, right? You would you would you would do a two step, right? You would develop, you would call some library code or you would develop some code in uh, in C because our processor doesn't run Java; it runs only C, uh, and then you would call that from from Java. But, but uh, the, yeah, so that, that's, that's kind of the model. Yeah? Our board is open, theirs is not. <laughs> that's the only thing that matters to me. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, no, I mean, I'm, no, just, I'm just kidding. So the, the, um, they're, you know, they're bored. They have great performance, right? They have higher performance than we do. Uh, uh, and it's, they have a GPU, whereas we have a core process. They have more cores. And so then you can go back and just compare data sheets and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's, you know I would say they're both good boards from a, I think they're both good boards from a performance standpoint. But to me, from a platform standpoint, I want an open board, right, with an open API. I don't want to program in CUDA. If I'm going to pick a vector language, I'm going to pick OpenCL. Um, so um, I, I think that's a major difference, right? If you, if you want a teaching platform, um, you want Parallel. If you want a, a really good graphics platform, you definitely want the Tegra. So depends what you're looking for. Why or when? Oh, but why only? Oh, why, why 4,096? Well, uh, it's just uh, um, we have a 32-bit address map, and so that's how many you get. So we, did, we assign with 32 bits, we assign 12 bits as a, the core ID and 20 bits inside the core. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what it comes out as. So, yeah, so the, yeah, actually there's two, two really answers to that question. So the, um, um, you know, the, the, the first step is going to be that you're going to be running uh, ARM on the host, on, uh, on the, uh, sorry, you're going to be j running Java on the host, the ARM processor, right? And then, you know, use the fork join model, use the, um, uh, the native interface and to talk to the epiphany, right? And then it's, that's more... Um, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a patch, right? Just like today, if you have to use a native interface, it's a little more work than if you can write everything in Java. 
Uh, I know there's some people who have been looking at running Java on the Epiphany processor. Now, right now, with the memory we have, it's not quite enough, but we are going to increase it. I mean, we're not far off, right? So it maybe it won't run super fast, but eventually you will be able to run Java on the Epiphany processors. Okay, well, thank you very much.